Hi, I am Logan Smith. I'm here to talk about using augmented reality in a non-ground-based uh, setting. A little about my background. I am the CTO of Argyle. We are a construction augmented reality solution. Uh, we do spatial project management, more than just heads-up display. Uh, this is a spatially aware augmented reality where we take the model and the data and the metadata of the digital twin and align it to its physical counterpart, the construction site in one-to-one -one, uh, AR, and then users can interact with that data, generate data, and view it all there in its place. Uh, I'm also the inventor of RISA, which is the enabling technology that allows for that large-scale uh, digital-to-physical alignment. Um, in a way that is resilient and uh, self-healing to adapt to the changing environment and maximizes precision so that as you move through the site and there are imperfections in the hardware or the tracking, uh, etc., that uh, always maximizes that precision where you need it the most. Uh, so the, the thesis for this talk is that while we... Uh, well, we know that these augmented reality tools can provide a big improvement to productivity and effectiveness. The existing tools are generally, uh, uh, by default, not compatible with uh, the non-earth-based, non-ground-based uses. Uh, but, and this is the big takeaway, the, all of those problems or potential problems are solvable. Uh, it is, they, they, they are based on assumptions. So I want to talk about some of those assumptions and give you at least a general idea in this short amount of time of how those can be uh, addressed. So the first is acceleration. Uh, to understand this, really, uh, we need to have a good idea of how this device knows its position in space. So this is the HoloLens 2 by Microsoft. It's uh, where we have developed Argyle, and it's a, a good demonstration, but this is true of all these devices. It uses a combination of SLAM and IMUs. So with SLAM, it's using visual sensors and it is seeing high contrast feature points and calculating its pose relative to those feature points. Uh, it's a, an effective uh, tried and true technology, but it has a high latency. So it can't keep up with quick movements, especially things like rotation. So these devices employ uh, IMU sensors on top of that, that is uh, inertial measurement units that can uh, sense that accelerometers, that kind of thing, um, and use that data to enhance the data coming in from SLAM and make those quick movements. And then for accuracy over time, SLAM is employed to adjust beyond that. So uh, since it's acceleration that these devices are sensing, you can imagine that with almost all uses, you're using them in a, in a stationary ground position. So you have this big 9.8 meters per second squared that we have to that, that we have to say is baseline. And so the device is always feeling that and it says, oh, I'm accelerating 9.8 meters per second squared. I guess I'm holding still, uh, which is great. But if you can imagine suddenly that goes away, the device says, oh, great. Now I know I'm in free fall and your holograms will start shooting up to the ceiling because it expects you to be falling down. Uh, this is a familiar problem to anyone who has tried to use AR on a large vehicle, planes, trains, automobiles, that type of thing. Uh, the holograms will throw themselves around in very strange, unpredictable ways as the SLAM and IMUs disagree with each other. Uh, and, and we can deal with that. The, it, it involves overriding the decisions being made based on the data coming in from the IMUs. The simplest way is just to ignore 
but then you do end up with that latency problem where your users really have to move abnormally slowly in order to maintain uh, the position of all the holograms and can get s or, or they get sick or have trouble interacting. The other way is to uh, override by calibration. Uh, by it, calibrating, we can do that in a static way where we say, okay, now we're in microgravity. So there is no 9.8, we were at a zero for the baseline and move from there. Or we can even employ a dynamic calibration where if the acceleration state is changing over time, we can use the SLAM data to gradually correct for the, uh, uh, to, to adjust what the assumption for the IMUs is. Uh, this is, we can't take really fast uh, changes. I wouldn't expect that to be able to work in a, a ship on rocky seas, but um, in, in a situation where it's slower changes of the acceleration baseline, that would be uh, very effective. The next two I want to get into are related to each other, and that is the floor plane and uh, the, the vertical axis. The floor plane, um, you wouldn't realize how much this is the case unless you're really in the AR industry, but so often the interface with the user is assuming that there is a floor plane that can either be defined by the user or automatically detected by the device. And then all of the interface is based on that plane and your position relative to it. Um, and then you place holograms within that floor plane and um, then the other piece is vertical. So these devices are sixed off. That means we have you know, the, the X, Y, and Z axes, but then we also have the rotation about those axes as the other degrees of freedom. So that's six degrees of freedom. The pitch, yaw, and roll, different industries have different uh, words for, for that. But so now you can imagine if we have this accelerometer baseline, almost in almost all cases, they use that to essentially give a, a normalized vector of the down direction, which what that does is in the interface, even though there are six degree, degrees of freedom and movement, the rotation about this axis and this axis are, can be essentially ignored by the application and just assumed based on this. And if we're using a ground plane in conjunction with the vertical, then we essentially remove the up and down axis of translation as well. So you have been able to have the luxury of ignoring basically three out of the six degrees of freedom when you work under these assumptions. This is totally solvable because already in augmented reality development, we have to accommodate the edge cases of the physical environment. Uh, when we have a user move into a new location, often uh, readouts and things like that will rotate to continue to face the user. Uh, that can, those sorts of techniques can be extended so that even if you're, say, rotating about the axis between you and the interface, uh, what you can do is essentially use the orientation of the user or of the device, which would be the down direction there. Because in almost all cases, that's, that's where down matters, is basically the user can uh, interact with, especially text or other sorts of data, in a way that aligns to them. And people have just been using gravity as that orientation. Um, so this is just a brief introduction because uh, we're very short on time here, but I do want you to take away that we can start to get some of these benefits as long as the developers that we're working with are prepared to uh, approach these problems uh, without these assumptions in place. Uh, if I'll, I'll be here if you have any questions about this. Um, if you're interested in the work that I do uh, at Argyle, uh, please contact us or uh, take a look at our website. Uh, that's argyle.build. And uh, thank you for having me.